Well, it's beginning to look like Christmas, isn't it? Thank you to all the ladies who showed up on Friday afternoon to come and to decorate this church. I love it. Uh, Barbara and Karen and I spent forever trying to figure out why some of the lights weren't turning on. And then we realized that we had plugs in the wrong places, and that's why it looks so beautiful. So thank you very much for the altar and the wreaths. It looks absolutely beautiful. And we know that Christmas is on its way. It's right around the corner because of the sights, correct? Because we are beginning to see Christmas trees and Christmas lights. Kaylee and I uh, yesterday went over to uh, Plantation Farms in Tyler to pick up our Christmas tree. It's one of our traditions as a family. We went over there and cut it down. Yes, I did manual labor for the first time in a while and cut it down and everything was was wonderful. And I told Jerry this morning that along with my manual labor, I have the pines of the tree and it was stuck in my wrist and everything. So yes, I, I do some sort of manual labor. And we know that Christmas is right around the corner because of the sights, but also there's a distinct sound to Christmas, correct? We just heard one of the most beautiful carols, uh, Oh Holy Night. And that's one of my favorite Christmas songs, Christmas carols. And there's one line in there, and I heard some people singing it. And the line that I want to bring to you this morning, uh, very important, a thrill of hope. A weary world rejoices, for yonder breaks a new and glorious morning. What a beautiful line that is, very theological line, and it's very important to realize that the carols that we sing are very theological in nature. They wrote them for that particular purpose. A thrill of hope, this expectation that hope is going to explode in the world. Uh, the weary world rejoices, this longing, this expectation for what the... Carol goes on to say this new and glorious morning, and we know what morning the carol is referring to. It's the morning that Christ himself was born. But the question is asked, well, what kind of hope are we talking about that the carol is speaking of? As Christians, we use the word hope often, don't we? We use it often. We'll have hope in Jesus And the hope that we're speaking of when we're using that language, that speech act, is not some sort of mere optimism. Well, I hope things are going to turn out the way I hope they're going to turn out. Well, I just hope that when I walk out into the street, I won't get hit by a car. This mere optimism, some sort of blind optimism. When we speak of the Christian worldview and the hope that we have in Christ, it's not blind optimism. Instead, hope is the confident expectation that in spite of everything that's going wrong in my life, that God's going to fulfill His promises to me. That's the hope that we're speaking of. Hope is the confident expectation that God is going to bring about His purposes in my life And in the world itself. But there is some sort of dilemma here, isn't it? We say that we have hope, this confident expectation that God is going to do what he says he's going to do. But when you look out into the world, it appears that we live in a very hopeless world. And it's hopeless because of violence and injustice and murder and let's just say the word, sin. There is a reality that rubs us wrong as Christians because we have hope in Christ and we look out into the world and it's hopeless. And this is where we're going to find ourselves this morning, noticing this tension in Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9, I want to invite you there this morning. And we're going to look at the first seven verses of Isaiah chapter 9. And we're going to see how we can have hope in the midst of hopelessness this morning. We're going to take a break from our book, our study in the book of James, and beginning today and going all the way to uh, December 21st, the weekend before Christmas, we're going to celebrate Advent. Advent is celebrated in higher churches, such as the Presbyterian and Methodist churches, and among the low churches, um, uh, like Baptist and congregational churches. So Advent as, isn't celebrated as much, which is unfortunate. Advent has a set of traditions that has been passed down all the way from the 3rd and 4th century. And Advent comes from the Latin word Adventus, which we get our English word coming. It simply means there's an expectation that Christ has come. And so during this Advent season, 
we will celebrate this coming of Christ. Not only his first coming, but we will look forward to his second coming. Advent centers around four main themes. Hope, love, peace, and joy. And so for the next four Sundays, we're going to look at these four themes one by one. This morning, we're going to look at hope. The title of the sermon is A Thrill of Hope. This expectation that hope is going to arrive in our midst, and it has in the person of Jesus. If you would, look with me at Isaiah chapter 9. I'll begin reading in verse 1. Actually, you know what? We'll begin in chapter 8, verse 21, to have the context for us. And they pass through the land, speaking of exile here. They pass through the land, greatly distressed and hungry. And when they were hungry, they were enraged, and they, they spoke, and they will speak contemptuously against their king and their God, and turn their faces upwards, turn their faces upwards in this sense of rebellion. And they will look to the earth, behold, distress and darkness, gloom of anguish, and they will be thrust into thick darkness. This is the language of exile. But notice what happens in verse 1 of chapter 9. But... There will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. In the former time, brought into contempt the land of Zebulon and land of Naphtali. But in latter times, in the end times, say, he has made a glorious way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. Notice the, the prophecy here in beginning in verse 2. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwell in the land of deep deep darkness, on them has light shone. You have multiplied the nations. You have increased its joy. And they rejoice before you. As with joy at the harvest, as uh, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden, the staff of his shoulder and the rod of his oppressor you referring to God you have broken as on the day of Midian for every boot of the trampling warrior in the battle of uh, tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fire burn as fuel for the fire but notice verse here this is where things begin to change for unto us a child is born To us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. And his name shall be called, now notice these names, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom To establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. Notice who will do it. And the zeal of the Lord of hosts or the Lord of armies will do this. Will you pray with me? Everlasting Father, thanks to you as we declare your steadfast love and faithfulness. We're asking that your wondrous works would be shown through to your servants this morning. And may your glorious power be revealed through your word. Make us glad, satisfy our hearts, and renew our minds as we read your word and as we hear your word preached this morning. I'm praying that as we begin to look at Isaiah chapter 9, that you would show us the hope that we have in King Jesus, the righteous King the King of justice, who reigns forever and ever. This hope that through Him we can have salvation in life itself. We know that your works are great and your thoughts are beyond our comprehension, so we're asking that you grant to us your people ears to hear, eyes to see the comforting promises of this text this morning. May we rest in the hope that is solely found in you, our refuge and our strength. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. This passage, Isaiah chapter 9, is situated 
between this series of events that are happening all the way from Isaiah chapter 6. If you remember Isaiah chapter 6, just off your Bible history, Bible knowledge. Isaiah 6 comes around and Isaiah receives the vision of the Lord. He is caught up in this vision. He goes up to see the Lord high and lifted up. And he's so sinful that he can't look upon the holiness of God. The seraphim are flying around. And they have six wings, two cover their eyes, two cover their feet, and with two they flew. And they sing this glorious herald, this song, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, and the whole earth is filled with His glory. That proclamation finds its way all the way through the book of Isaiah. And then Isaiah chapter 7 rolls around. After Isaiah receives his commission to preach this good news, this gospel that the Lord is holy... And there's a sign that's given to Isaiah. There will be a son who will be born of a virgin. And this son will be called Emmanuel, God with us. And we know who that prophecy is referring to, Jesus. But what happens in Isaiah chapter 8 is this promise of destruction will come. This proclamation that exile will come and take the people captive. The Assyrians will come in. And uh, there will be, they'll come in like a, a flood of water. They will rush over the people of Israel. And the northern kingdom will be taken away into exile because of their rebellion against God. And so I read, beginning in verse 21 of chapter 8, that there will be distress in the land. They will go hungry. And they will call out and they will curse God. And they'll lift their faces up to heaven and rebel against God. Does that sound familiar at all? This people of exile longing and looking for someone to come. And then Isaiah chapter 9 shows up. Isaiah sees this prophecy, this vision of a king who will come. Isaiah chapter 9 beginning in verse 1 and moving to verse 3 We're going to see one particular point that's so important that there is hope and joyful salvation in the midst of exile, in the midst of hatred, war, and violence, and darkness in the land. There is indeed hope because salvation has arrived to save the people of God. And then in verses 4 through 5, there is hope when oppression and war will cease, will begin to move through the uh, the images, uh, images there in verses 4 through 5, that oppression itself and war itself, violence itself, will cease because the king will arrive and bring hope. And then in verses 6 and 7, the section that we all know, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. There is indeed hope when the king, of, when the king arrives. So there is hope When salvation comes, there's hope. When oppression and war will cease, and there's hope when the king himself will arrive. Isaiah is built around four main themes. Over the next four weeks, we're going to look at passages in Isaiah. There's four main themes out of Isaiah that we need to understand. First of all, there's a proclamation of hope and judgment. We see that in this this text this morning. There is a proclamation of judgment found in chapter 8. But there is also a proclamation of hope for the people. Second, there is a preservation of the remnant. Isaiah is speaking to the remnant. The people in exile longing for this king to come. Third, there is a call to practice your righteousness that comes from God. Lastly, there is the promise of a king in this morning. We're going to look at the promise of the king. Verse 1, but there will be no gloom for her who was in anguish. The language of exile, we looked at chapter 8, beginning in verse 21, this language of exile. There will be darkness in the land, anguish, despair. Why? Because of Israel's rebellion against the Lord. They chose not to follow the law that was given to them for their good. They rebelled against Yahweh. And as a result, the Assyrian army is going to come in and bring them into captivity because they sinned against the Lord. But notice there's a promise in verse 1 of chapter 9. There will be no anguish. There will be no gloom for her that was once in anguish. Notice, and in the former times he brought about contempt. Contempt. 
He brought about chaos, judgment in the land of Zebulon and Naphtali. These two tribes are part of the northern kingdom. And these two kingdoms were the first kingdoms that, or the, the first tribes that went off into exile. And so the Lord here through the prophet Isaiah that there was once contempt in the land. There was once exile, but now in the latter times, there's not anymore. These two tribes that went off into exile, they're no longer in exile anymore. But notice here, but in latter times, he made a glorious way by the sea, the land beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the nations. When the enemies would come and attack Israel, where did they come through? They came through Galilee, the northern part of Israel. They came through there. They would squeeze their way over the Jordan River and go by the Sea of Galilee. That's where Israel would be attacked from. But notice that this way of despair and destruction has been turned into a what? A glorious way of the sea. Galilee of the nations. Isn't it significant then that when Jesus begins his ministry, where does he begin? He doesn't begin in Jerusalem. He doesn't begin in Judea. He begins where? Galilee. That is where Jesus established his ministry headquarters, we could say. In Galilee, one of the most despised and rejected areas of Israel. The place where enemies would come and take Israel captive. Jesus established his ministry headquarters there. Why? Because in latter times... In the end times, when Jesus came in on the scene, he established the kingdom of God. He established this way of peace and salvation. And now look at verse 2. Isaiah speaks of a time that during the midst of war, hatred, darkness, and violence, salvation would erupt in the midst of their presence. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Notice this poetic language here. And those who dwell in the land of deep darkness, on them has shown light. Those who were once in exile have seen a great light. Now we know the imagery of darkness and light in the Bible, don't we? Darkness is obviously bad, isn't it? In this context, darkness is the symbol of exile, despair. But notice, they have seen a great light. They've seen the light of salvation that has come upon them. Now, imagine yourself for a moment living in a land that wasn't your home. Let's say that we've lived in this certain piece of Maybank for a while. And because of our rebellion, God has judged us. And we were taken out of our land and transported into a land that wasn't our home. That's the situation that Isaiah is writing into. These people living in darkness, exile, despair, hopelessness have seen a great light. The light of redemption, the light of salvation, joy and peace. This promise that Isaiah speaks to them, he speaks to them as though it has already occurred. They have seen a great light. Notice verse 3, you have multiplied the nation, speaking of the nation of Israel, the remnants. And you have increased its joy. Why? Because salvation has come. This light has come upon them. And they will rejoice before you as with joy of a harvest. The abundant harvest that comes and the joy that you have when you gather the crops and you see, wow, we have food to eat. And as they glad when they divide the spoil at the end of war... What happens? You gather all the gold, you gather all that stuff, and you divide it out, and you're satisfied with it. And Isaiah is saying that when salvation comes, there will be overwhelming and abundant joy. Joy that is compared to an abundant harvest, and joy that is the equivalent to spoils divided at the end of war. Hope brings about joy. In the midst of exile, in the midst of darkness, this ancient promise shows us that there will indeed be hope. That there is hope even when we least expect it. There's hope right around the corner. Hope that doesn't come from within us. 
Hope that doesn't arise within my own intellect or within my own doing. Hope that comes from outside of me. Hope that comes from God himself. There is hope and joyful salvation. Notice verse 4 and 5. For the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken on the day of Midian. Now, again, this is somewhat foreign to us because we don't live in this time. But notice, these instruments of oppression, the yoke of his burden. A yoke was usually put around someone and they were treated like animals. Uh, as slaves, they, were, they put this yoke upon them and they were uh, told to take this yoke. Uh, they were probably strapped onto their backs, a cart of some sort. And they were treated like animals. But notice, this yoke would be broken one day. The staff was meant to point and direct the slaves to tell them where to go. That will be broken. The rod of his oppressor. The rod was used to whip the exile. That will be broken. These instruments of oppression would one day be thrown away. God is the one who would do this. Now imagine again living in a world where you're in exile. Where you're a slave. When you're broken and beaten and whipped. And you receive this promise that one day. One day. There will be hope. That oppression itself will be done away with. Broken as on the day of Midian. This echoes all the way back to Judges chapter 7, 19 through 25. Where Gideon gathers his 300, the army of 300. And what do they go, go do? They go into Midian and they conquer. They take over the people who wants to oppress them. God has broken the oppression. The point is very simple. One day, the people would receive liberation. One day, at some particular point in time in the future from Isaiah's writing, there is going to come a king, just like Gideon himself, who would liberate the people from their sin and oppression and exile. And Isaiah goes on in verse 5, But every boot of the trampling warrior and every garment will be rolled in blood and will be burned as fuel for the fire. The point, I think, is very clear. That one day war itself will cease. One day war, the violence and the hatred will be done away with. Again, I think for an exile, you would say, wow, I hope that day comes quick. I sure hope that day comes when the king will arrive and oppression and discrimination and war and hatred and violence would be completely eradicated. The instruments of war, the instruments of oppression would be done away with. There is joy, there is hope when war will cease. Now again, we're not exiles. Well, we are. The church is an exilic community. That's what Peter says, doesn't he? That we are resident aliens, temporary foreigners in a land that's really not our home. We have to admit that this land's really not our home, is it? That we're just passing through pilgrims awaiting for this heavenly city to come down. That we will be rescued from war and oppressions, oppression and violence. I mean, we've just seen it this past week, haven't we? With the Ferguson situation. Well, we can say, well, that didn't affect us. Oh, it, it does. It really does. We live in a, a place where there is violence. Where there is war. Where there is Oppression. One day, someone will come. One day, someone will come and eradicate all that. Someday, notice verse 6. For unto us, a child is born. Unto us, a son is given. God's answer, one commentator said. God's answer to everything that has ever terrified us. Violence, war, sin, death. God's answer to everything that has terrified us is a son. A son will be born. A child 
would be born. Calvin says this, not only will God bring people back from captivity, but he will place Christ on his royal throne. And under him there will be supreme and everlasting happiness that will be enjoyed forever. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. Notice the promise here. And the government shall be upon his shoulders. The government itself. All the empires of the world will one day bow before this son. And they will confess him to be Lord. I think we know who the son is. I think we know who this prophecy is referring to. That the birth of this child represents hope. In the midst of war and violence and oppression and heartache and pain, sin and death, there is hope. Hope that is found in a son. Hope that is found in a child who was born. Hope that God will act in the midst of of us, hope that God has not forsaken us, hope that in one day a child would be born as king, and the government will be upon his shoulders. Government where we can look and say, I want to follow that king. One day we're not going to have a vote. <laughs> one day democracy is not going to be here, but there will be a theocracy. And his name, the king, is found here. And his name shall be called what? Wonderful counselor. This means that in his counsel, he is wonderful in everything he says. That he needs wisdom as king. This is referring to his wisdom. That he will have wisdom greater than Solomon himself. Who prayed that he would receive wisdom. And he was praised for his wisdom. This title is describing the wisdom that he not only has, but the wisdom that he gives to his servants. He will need wisdom as a king. Notice the second title, the second name. Mighty God. This title is describing his might as God himself. The power that he displays over all creation. He's the mighty God. He's the everlasting father. This is the highest title that a king could receive in the ancient Near East. Uh, I was telling Kaylee last night as I was researching this. I've always wondered what these four titles meant. And specifically the title of everlasting father. This is the highest title that a king could receive in the ancient Near East. In Babylon or Assyria. And this title refers to the king who has power to direct time itself. He's the one that directs, produces, and controls time and eternity. He is the father of all the ages. He's the father of all time and eternity. And notice the last title. He's the prince of war. Doesn't say that. He's the prince of peace. He's the prince who brings about peace and blessing to his people. Peace is not just the absence of war. Peace itself is where we get the Hebrew word shalom. Have you heard that word before? Shalom is not just the absence of war. Shalom is total welfare and well-being for all of creation. And this king is the prince of peace. These four titles... Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, or throne names. When a king would be, uh, when he would ascend to the throne, he was given names. For example, if you've seen the movie or you've read the book, Chronicles of Narnia, Aslan was given a throne name. He's the emperor beyond the sea. Uh, Prince William, he has throne names. He's the Earl of Duke, or he, he has different other throne names, the great... Poobah or whatever. I don't know. He has different throne names. I try to research them, but there's like 12 of them. He's the Earl of Scotland or Wales or whatever. But the point is, they're giving the, they're given these names. And they're not just names that you can add on to your title and make you some significant person. Names are given to kings because they represent something. 
they're describing his nature. They're describing his significance, his value here in this context, in the ancient Near Eastern context that Isaiah is writing into. Throne names were given to reflect divine identity. Because a king would be a god in their eyes. For example, Caesar in the first century, they viewed him as God. They viewed him as the Lord. In the Assyrian times that Isaiah is writing into, the king of Assyria would be as a god to the people. Do you remember the king of Tyre? Uh, the, the prophecy that was given that I saw the, the, the one fall from heaven, that's referring to the king of Tyre. It's as if he's described as a god himself. Well, here, who is this son? Who is this king? He is God himself. He's the wonderful counselor. He's almighty God. He is the father who rules and directs and controls all time. And he's the prince who brings about peace and blessing for his people. These throne names describe the king. Verse 7, and of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be, look at this promise, there will be no end. When this son arrives, when he inaugurates his kingdom, and when he reigns as king, his kingdom will not end. His reign will not end. And on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it with justice and uphold it with righteousness. This king for Israel had to be a Davidic king. It couldn't be you or I. It had to be a king who would come from the line of David himself. In fulfillment of 2 Samuel chapter 7 verse 14. This king had to be a descendant of David. Because that king would do. No other king would do except for a Davidic king. This king would come one day. And what will happen And from this time forth and forevermore. He will reign with justice and righteousness. He will be the everlasting father. He will be the prince of peace. He will be the wonderful counselor. He will be the almighty God. He will be the king that will eradicate oppression and war. He will be the king that will bring about salvation for his people. He will be the king and they will know him by the name Jesus. He will be the king who would come. In Luke chapter 1 verses 26 through 33. When the angel comes up to Mary, and the angel says, Blessed, O favored one, you have found favor in the sight of the Lord. And Mary says, What did you just say to me? <laughs> Excuse me? And the angel goes on to say, You will have a son, and you will call him Yeshua, Jesus. His name will be Jesus. Yahweh saves is the meaning of his name. And you will call him Jesus. And he will reign on the throne of his father David. He will establish a kingdom. And there's not going to be an end to his kingdom. Tells of a son who will be born. A king. This king who will reign as the Davidic king. And the ancient promise of Isaiah chapter 9 will come to fulfillment when this king is born. A king who will reign with peace and righteousness. A king who will reign and bring in salvation for his people. A Davidic king who will conquer all enemies. Who will win the war. Who will bring salvation to this people. And the birth of this son will inaugurate this kingdom. And we have to ask this all-important question. Is there hope in a world when it seems like there's no hope? Is there hope in a world that is filled with hopelessness and despair? A world that's filled with chaos, war, discrimination, injustice. Is there indeed hope? And I think the answer is very clear. Yes. But how? His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. Yahweh 
saves. He is the son proclaimed about in Isaiah chapter 9. He is the son who will bring about hope for his people and salvation. He's the one who will bring about hope when war and oppression will cease. He's the one who will bring about the kingdom of God. And it's in this hope that we can rest. This ancient promise found in Isaiah chapter 9 that echoes of a time when a king will come. My friends, the king has already come. We're looking past the cross. We're looking beyond the cross. And we see a a baby born in a manger in Bethlehem. And who shows up? Shepherds. The lowest of the low in society. Not the kings, not the rulers of the world. But the shepherds would be born. The shepherds would come and see the baby born. And it's in this that we have hope. We have peace. But this text also reminds us. As it points forward to a coming. A second coming. When he will reign forever and ever. He will reign and his kingdom will have no end. And so in this I want to submit to you. That there is a thrill of hope. And as this weary world rejoices for yonder breaks a new and glorious morning, that morning has already come. That morning has come. And Mary gave birth to a son named Jesus. And the ancient promise of Isaiah chapter 9 has already found its fulfillment in Christ in his first coming. But we look forward to his second coming. So this Christmas season, it's could be really easy to get depressed or unsatisfied with what, the way the world's going, but it's because it, it always seems like during this Christmas season, something happens. We see the injustice of the world. We see the violence and the hatred and the murder. And in this time of cheer and thanksgiving and hope, we can rest assured that there is indeed hope. And it's in a person. Jesus, Jesus who saves, Jesus who gives hope to his people. But that hope doesn't just reside with us, does it? This time of thanksgiving and giving itself, the greatest gift of all that we can give to others is the gift of the gospel, the message that there is hope. That in Jesus Christ, who bore our wrath, bore the wrath of God, bore our sin on the cross, that he provides hope for us. That three days later after he was crucified, God raised him from the dead and said, "Uh uh-uh, the death does not have my son. And he raised him up from the dead. And where does Christ sit right now? In heaven. And what is he doing? He's reigning as king. He is reigning as king. And one day he will return to this earth. And he will establish his kingdom forever. And in that we can have hope. And it's that hopeful message that we can share with others this season. And I want to invite you in this time as we go into the invitation just for a moment. I want to invite you to bow your head and close your eyes. Just take this time, just take this moment and ask the Lord, would you give me hope? Would you give me hope when it feels like this world is filled with hopelessness? Because the reality is it is. It is filled with hopelessness and pain and heartache. Ask the Lord to give you hope this morning. Would you remember the ancient text of Isaiah chapter 9 and think about war and oppression ceasing. Think about the war that has been brought about because of sin. Think about the oppression that is brought about because of sin. Not just external oppression, but the internal oppression because of our own sin. And think about how Christ, being born into this world, being the son that was given to us, and of the increase of the kingdom of God, being brought about through his life and through his death, Would you ask the Lord in this moment, give me hope.